seeing ourselves as bad as a direct threat to the human ego. And that's like the last thing we want. It's normal. It's biological. So sometimes we have to make peace more important than being right. And that's, you know, that's another thing we have to look at. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the On The Ball podcast, where we have curious conversation about life, career, spirituality, and anything in between. My name is Aniku Tut, a civil engineer turned world traveler, public speaker, trainer, and Toastmasters champion. My goal is to bring you inspirational topics and people that can help you find your own definition of success. When you are ready, it is time to be On The Ball. This podcast will be truly inspiring for you and probably for many people you know. So please share the link of the podcast with them. Also, a quick reminder, hit the subscribe and love buttons to get notified about the upcoming episodes. Then share a rating and a review if you like what you are listening to. Our guest today is an inspiring young professional who tries to bring difference into our world by talking peace. She's a speaker, podcaster, political activist, whose mission is to create equality in our planet. Amanda Haidar is a great friend of mine who was born in Canada, was raised in Lebanon, lived in Ireland and Switzerland before moving back to Lebanon. Amanda has a degree in political science, but her real passion lies in solving conflicts and creating peace. She's a journalist with a unique and exciting job in Lebanon. Believe it or not, but Amanda is writing the next history book for which she needs to talk to historians, experts, and understand all sides of an issue. This incredible woman has worked at the United Nations, has a collaboration with the Hack Peace Project, as in involved with NGOs and multiple peacemaking platforms. Amanda's podcast, Let's Talk Peace, is a platform that casts the spotlight on individuals leading impactful peace-building initiatives in their communities. Our topic for this episode is about finding peace with the world and with ourselves. So let's not waste more time and start our episode. Hello everyone and welcome back to the On The Ball podcast where our guest is Amanda Haidar, the host of the Let's Talk Peace. I'm so happy to see you here and I'm always loving this podcast because it gives me a chance to reconnect with friends and share their unique wisdom with the world. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm so excited to be on. My first question to you is this history book project. It sounds so exciting. How is it coming along? What is the stage of it? Like? It's coming along pretty well. So the process of writing the book has been rather interesting. Uh, it's a Lebanese history book, in case people don't know. Um, and I, by no means, am a historian. I'm a writer and I am many other things, but I am not a historian. I do not have a degree in history, although I love history. Absolutely love it. So I'm working closely with a very well-known historian here in Lebanon. And what we are doing is we are writing each chapter by chapter. So we set out a timeline of the historical periods that happened in the country from antiquity to present day. And then after setting kind of like milestones for it. We delve into the research of each period, each chapter, and I write it up and we go back and forth. And that's kind of how it's been going. But it's been a really fun project so far. It does sound something like a super exciting project. Is it only the two of you or are you really interviewing other historians and experts? And Yeah. So up until now, it's just been us two because we're focusing more on like the ancient history of the country. We're still in the mm -hmm. earlier stages. But eventually we will also be conducting interviews with different politicians and policymakers and different individuals uh, that that have things to do with this. So, yeah. Yeah. In that way, like it's challenging to understand all sides and see who is right and who is wrong. Every coin has two ends. So do you have like a tactic on how to understand and how to figure out which one to include and how to do all these things? That's a very good question. So just some background information on that. So Lebanon itself as a country, it's it's quite divided. It's divided along religious sectarian lines. So there is no single narrative for history. 
especially for the history of the conflicts that have happened here. So in Lebanon, we've had a civil war from 1975 till 1990. And that entire period is not taught in schools. It's absent from the history books that people learn about. So basically, as a Lebanese citizen, you wouldn't be learning about the conflicts that occurred in the country in the education system, which is pretty messed up because then the only way that you would learn about these types of issues would be at home. Mm -hmm. where a lot of prejudices exist and a lot of narratives differ depending on what background you come from, what, what socioeconomic or what sectarian background you come from. So when we are, so through writing the book, what, who do we decide who to listen to? I'd like to say that we listen to all sides because every perspective is valid. Mm -hmm. So everybody's pain is valid. Every but experience is valid, but validity and truth are two different things. Yes. But to be able to, but to be able to really create a holistic snapshot of the history of this country, you have to consider every perspective. But the main sort of lens through which we are creating this book is it's not very neutral. I'm not going to say it's neutral because neutrality would be beyond the point of what we're trying to do with this. The point of this book is to create cohesion mm -hmm. amongst Lebanese society. Because if you think about it, the subject of history, it's never neutral. It's always, as they often say, written by the victor. So exactly. the, the victorious forces, they're the ones that write the history book. They're the ones that create the narrative that is then perpetuated for, mm -hmm. for all time. So, so with this, our agenda, if you will, is peace. <laughs> as you know of course <laughs> but that's basically it so we are presenting history in a very factual way a very phenomenological way so why would you do that like how do you do that actually so okay with ancient history it's a little bit easier because nobody really you know it's not that <laughs> contested it's like facts okay this happened this is where we come from the, this empire was here and then this empire came but with the modern history it's it's contemporary history it's a little bit more complicated so oh gosh so for the chapter of the civil war specifically the, the angle that we are going to be taking is a peace building angle so i'm going to be explaining a lot of peace building theory. I have a background in conflict resolution. So we will be focusing on things such as like, why do wars occur? Okay, these are the circumstances that lead to conflict. And these then are the things that you need to have peace in a society. So how do we solve our issues? How do we move forward together? That's more of the focus. We won't be going very much into the nitty gritties of, oh, this person did this and this person did that. There's a lot of pain on every side. And obviously we will honor that pain, but we will not lose the whole purpose of the book by going into these tiny details of this person did this, they're bad and this is wrong and it's this person's fault. Because in a way, everyone is at fault. War doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. It's not rational as, as much as as much as they'd like to paint the picture that it was justified. It, I, in my opinion, as a pacifist, it's never justified. There's always a better way to solve conflict in society. I love the mindset that you want to actually see what was happening and build a lecture out of that. Like, how can we blend it in the, in the present and in the future? Because that is what I feel about history books and all about history, that we do and repeat the same things, the same mistakes, and we, for some reason, never learn from it. And we are never taught how to learn from it. So just yes. your perspective and creating that peace table yeah. of contents <laughs> makes the difference yeah. yeah because they say that history repeats itself and to an extent this is true because if we don't learn from our mistakes we're going to repeat them obviously but the thing is you can learn from your mistakes at both the individual level and the, the wider sociological level of you know the macrocosm but but yeah so we want to present solutions in addition to just you know recounting facts to people so, yeah. <laughs> mm. So what would be a few of the peacemaking steps that you would mention if you have a few ideas on that? We're going to go into peace building theory. So I'm a big fan of the founder of, peace, of, the, founder of the field of peace and conflict studies. His name is Professor Johan Galtung. He's this Norwegian psychologist slash mathematician. He's a genius. This man revolutionized the way that we think about conflict and peace and the way that we deal with such things. Uh, he worked as a conflict mediator and he has some very interesting theories. So 
So let's go to the way that Galtung, this man, d- defines the concept of peace. Mm-hmm. So when you think of peace, maybe the average person's mind would go towards an image of, you know, no violence. So, okay, no bloodshed, that must be peace. But Galtung says, no, this is not peace. This is negative peace. So the absence of violence, that's not, that's not peace on its own. Galton has this concept called positive peace, which in essence is negative peace, which is the absence of violence, but with social justice as well. So this can mean many things. Um, this must include the fact that, that to have peace, each individual must be able or have the option of actualizing their fullest potential. Mm-hmm. This might sound a bit complicated. In other words, peace to Galtung basically is a society or a state of being where every individual's potential is unobstructed. So you don't have things that are obstructing potential and people can become what they were meant to be. So kind of like reaching your highest version, which is very spiritual and idealistic. And I love it. Yes. And it kind of it ties. So I don't know if you read, you've read The Republic by Plato. It's a classic. But the way Socrates defines his ideal utopia is very similar to how Galtung, the father of peace and conflict studies, defines peace. They define it as a state of of social being and existence where every individual is led to becoming their fullest version. So if you Mm -hmm. were a fish, you would be doing fish things. You wouldn't be forced to be a bird, right? And a bird would do bird things. Yeah. So then by doing that, each person would be fulfilling their role and you would have the maximum amazing possible society that you can even imagine, right? And but another thing when it comes to peace is is violence. So you have to understand violence to understand peace. And many of the times we think of violence as just being, you know, the, the violence that you see. But Galton, so it's it's more than just that. There's something called structural violence that we have to consider. Mm-hmm. And this is the violence that exists within our systems. So for example, how would how would this apply to the Lebanese history book? By explaining the political system through that lens, you would get people to start thinking in a different way. Um, so the system here in Lebanon, it's a consociation system. It's called consociationalism. We have uh, political roles divided along religious sectarian lines. And because it's divided along religious sectarian lines, it's called confessionalism. Mm-hmm. Basically, what this means is the president of the country has to be a Maronite Christian. That's a sect for those of you who are not Lebanese and don't know what a Maronite is. The know. prime minister has to be a Sunni Muslim and the speaker of our parliament has to be a Shiite Muslim. So different sects. And then you have different proportions for the members of parliaments. Basically, Sorry. everything in our governmental system is divided along religion. So if I, Amanda, want to be president, I cannot because I'm not a Maronite. Like it's not even in the, you know, choice options for me. But the point here is exactly right. It's insanity. And this is an agreement they came to, uh, it really became solidified after the civil war with an agreement Mm. called the top. That we don't know anything about. Yeah, but to put that aside, this is an example of structural violence. This system is founded on violence Mm -hmm. and there's no way out of it. So we have to deal with these types of things if we want actual, positive, full peace, Mm -hmm. right? And and some might say that, oh, that's very idealistic, like get down from the clouds. But it's so important to be setting these high standards for ourselves because that way you will you will at least go further than than if you set a lower standard for yourself like it's always mm-hmm. good to have an idea of a utopia to work towards because it's a constant process like growth doesn't end so why not aim high right <laughs> yeah and besides the structural violence there's another aspect to violence that we often don't consider and that is cultural violence the mm-hmm. violence that occurs that, that is basically embedded in different cultures and we see this with a lot of different belief systems and practices that you know might seem normal um from day to day. So we have to look at those as well. Yeah. And yeah, it's not easy. I mean, the hardest thing for a human to do, you know, we're egoistic creatures. We seeing ourselves as bad as a direct threat to the human ego. And that's like the last thing we want. It's Mm -hmm. normal. It's biological. So sometimes we have to make peace more important than being right. And that's, you know, that's another thing we have to look at. Yeah. And how can we do that? So many people are 
functioning from their egos. They are doing everything from that side of their mind. So how can we put aside that ego and think more about peace and other person? I love it. This is an age old question. All of the gurus, <laughs> all of the religious teachers, all of the self help, everyone has tried to answer this question. And I would say the best chance we have for this is through awareness. So just become aware of it. It's okay. Like we, human nature exists on a spectrum, there is good and there is bad within each and every one of us. But we have free will and we can choose which aspects of human nature to bring out into the world. But as far as creating more peace goes and, and really getting out of that ego state, which, by the way, is not bad. You're not bad for having an ego. You're mm. human. But it's just good to keep it in check sometimes because you can cause other people pain. I think the biggest chance, the closest we have in this world to a panacea for all of the world's problems is empathy. Mm -hmm. Now, some people might be like, oh, empathy, seriously. Yes, empathy. Because when you understand someone, when you relate to them, you cannot hate them. You cannot possibly cause them harm without mm -hmm. also feeling pain yourself. And that, in essence, is love. That's my definition of love. It's mm -hmm. to take the other as a part of yourself. And in doing that, in taking the other as a part of yourself, you can no longer hurt them without also hurting yourself. And if we mm -hmm. all did this, I mean, you know, at the individual level, your relationships would be better with other people. And at the governmental level, maybe policies would be made differently. You'd have a lot less human exploitation and mm -hmm. different things. And, you know, at the personal level, it's important also to have empathy towards yourself. We, we, we you know, all of it stems from your relationship with yourself at the end of the day. So, so many people struggle with that. We demonize our negative emotions. We push parts of ourselves away. Yeah. And this does nothing to the yeah that was my next question like you might i really liked how you put that violence like peace is not the absence of violence but we are not only projecting violence to the outside world but also towards ourselves we are violating our thoughts we are violating our feelings on a daily basis and we are not feeling empathy towards ourselves it's one step that we start feeling empathy towards another person but we are still questioning ourselves and have that lack of empathy within ourselves. Do you have any practices for that? Or how do you apply peace in your daily life? That's an excellent, excellent question because it all starts there. It all starts within, with our daily lives. So I actually have a few practices that I do in my day-to-day -day life, although I by no means am perfect. Like I have a peace podcast, right? And I still get in fights with my family. I still fight with my brothers. Like my older brother the other day, we were fighting and he was like, Amanda, you have a peace podcast and you're not a peaceful person. Like, why are you a hypocrite? And I, <laughs> it drove me insane. <laughs> but that's not the point because you can't be perfect. But as long as you are aware of what you're doing and, you know, you reflect on it, it's okay. because you're human just take it easy mm -hmm. on yourself and I would say okay I'll, I'll get to the specific practices that people can check out in a bit mm -hmm. but before I want to say I want to say something about emotions because okay we, we often view emotions like our own personal feelings as weaknesses or things to be pushed away especially things like anger these negative feeling states we demonize them we suppress reject and deny mm. deny deny certain aspects of ourselves but this All doesn't make them go away. exactly exactly this what this does when we reject these parts of ourselves they they are relegated to the subconscious where where they fester and they create all kinds of problems when we do this type of thing we begin to project onto others we we form aversions towards certain traits and people and we form attractions also if it's something that you really loved in yourself and you suppressed it you become attracted to that externally but if it's something you really hated and then you suppressed because it made you bad and wrong then you will start to hate it and others as well mm. and yeah I've had certain experiences like this in my life I you know some people think I'm <laughs> I was very angry as a person <laughs> but what I would say is delve into the shadow really examine yourself, know thyself, get to know yourself better. Um, mm -hmm. Every single relationship we have is kind of a mirror, a reflecting absolutely. back to ourselves. A mirror. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, in my personal life, I've watched relationships in my life transform 
when I started to do this process of really looking within and examining and bringing those demons closer, like, you know, inviting them in for tea and just listening to what they had to say. Because a lot of these negative emotions, what's behind them is pain or fear. It's not bad. It's not bad to be angry. It's not, you know, but yeah, like uh, for, for one example, I had this particular family member who I was just, oh, I did not get along with one bit. I hated everything about this family member. <laughs> I'm not going to say what family member. Well, I could, but um, I, I really sat with myself and this took years, I'd say, but in the end, I, 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 I had to look within at my own darkness. And when I did that, it kind of dissolved the tension between me and this family member because because I, I began to understand them. And again, you cannot hate that which you understand. And we are only mm. ever victims of victims. I will say that. But as far as practices go that people can implement within their own lives to create that inner peace and to you know generate self-love, mm. I would highly recommend meditation. I cannot recommend this enough. There are many ways to do this and there are many different types of meditation. Um, some people don't really like the still meditations where you sit there and you like quiet your mind. There are moving meditations. Yoga is meditation. Um, also, I like personally, I do breathing techniques every morning. So I'm, I'm a fan of those because it's, you know, it's, it's easier to keep with. And there's also a process that I would like, like to recommend to people called the completion process. It's by this woman named uh, Teal Swan. And basically, this is a process that you can practice on yourself, or you can also go to a specialist who will help you, like guide you through it. It's a therapy method, essentially. And basically, what this, this process is, is it's it's basically a process to, to deal with past trauma. So essentially you go into the trauma and you create resolve there because a lot of the times in our lives, especially early on in childhood, we go through these traumatic events and we have no resolve and then they keep creating issues in our present day. And that just doesn't have to be the case. So the moment that you create resolve there, it just, it vanishes. You gain the awareness, you learn the lesson and you can move forward. But sometimes we're held back by these things. Uh, another process I would like to recommend is a process called The Work by Byron Katie. And this one, yeah, The Work, The Work, it's super, it's amazing. So this one is really good if you're in conflict with another person. It's like you can download a worksheet off her website. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. Check it out and just meditate. Um, I do not recommend drugs. Never go to, to drugs. Some people, they take Ayahuasca like... Ayahuasca and take, everything, I guess. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, like uh, a lot of like the people that are into the self-help meditation, they, they would go towards like psychedelics for that experience that solves all their issues. It's never, it's never going to solve the issue. Trust me. Like I have not personally gone that route, but I know people who have. And sometimes you do get insights from those types of methods, but then you always attach the ability to get insight to that, that substance, mm. but you can do it on your own. You can do it organically. It's all within you. And yeah, that's what I say. And then for peace on the outer realm of things, when you have peace within, you just radiate, honestly, it's the energy that you put out and you get it back. Yeah. Everything yeah. is energy. Everything like, it's always a transaction of energy and time and we need to decide on what what do we want to give and how are we giving it are we aligned or not so going down more on this alley when we think about peace and inner peace do you know anything how it relates to our health and how it's aligned with our lives in any way absolutely so peace is definitely definitely tied to health. I mean, going back to the definition of peace by the founder of Peace and Conflict Studies, Johann Galtung, it's when you are in alignment with your highest purpose and you're, you're only acting in alignment with that that comes naturally to you. You're not forcing yourself to be any other way. There's nothing, mm. nothing obstructing your health. So if, if we were committed to peace and to our, our natural state of being, which in essence can be considered harmony, it, we would be a lot happier. We would be living in alignment with our highest self and we'd be in a natural state of health and of energy because peace is, it's definitely conductive to our well being, And, and by doing this, you would no longer be at war with yourself. You know, we would have a lot less 
addictions in 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 human society that are happening because if you look at something like addiction like what is at the root of addiction does somebody just wake up one day and decide they want to be addicted to this or that no it's coming from a place of pain we're running away from a negative feeling state there's loneliness behind that there's pain so with peace you're no longer running away from that loneliness or that anger or that fear you're looking at directly in the face and you're you're resolving it mm-hmm. so so yeah it's definitely tied to peace and yeah, and when you're at peace with yourself, you're no longer at peace also with the external world. So you'd have a lot, you know, a lot less crime. Happy people don't hurt people. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll say that. For some reason, <laughs> why, why, why could that be? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, well, so then practicing inner and outer peace kind of creates peace everywhere. And when we find the steps and break them down to daily practices that aids not only us, but the whole world, is that correct? Absolutely. So that's why self-love is so important. It's something that's thrown around a lot these days. It's like a, you know, a buzz, a buzzword, but it is so important to, to love yourself, to be at peace with yourself, whatever you want to call it, because it really does start there. I mean, it really does. Unfortunately, many peace movements, they are called radical, they are called crazy, and they are fighting against the government, they are fighting against what should be. What do you say to that? Okay, so in my (laughs) personal understanding of in the world, according to Amanda, I, I believe that these radical movements that involve violence are not peace movements. When you have violence, that's not peace. But... Because when you're fighting something, an oppositional force, you're not going to get what you want because you're playing a zero-sum game. I win, you lose. Zero-sum games do not work. This is also proven by research. The zero-sum games that we play, they do not work. What is a zero-sum game? Could you explain that? Yeah, so basically it's I win, you lose. Uh, I can have this, but then you're going to lose, or you win, and then I'm going to lose. But you Mm -hmm. can create a scenario where both sides win. And I think with a lot of these violent peace movements, there's a lack of understanding among the parties. And that that just makes things escalate. Because if you had effective communication, you would have a better shot at attaining that, that peace or that goal that you want. When communication begins to deteriorate, that's when you get conflict. Um, another reason why people might consider peace movements radical, maybe if they don't involve violence, would be because they are scared of change. A lot of the times we fear that which we don't understand, and that's totally normal, but you know, that, that risks being labeled radical. But we also have to remember then that normal is not a measure of health and it's not a measure of rightness. For example, mm-hmm. you know, in the past, women drink, like pregnant women drinking alcohol, that was considered normal, or you know, owning slaves, that was considered normal. Normal is not a measure of good, it's not a measure of health. So we need to be more open. Yeah. Have you ever been called radical? Yes. Yes. What was your response? (laughs) You have to react with compassion. Again, I'm not perfect all the time. I do get angry sometimes, but then you sit with yourself and you really just have to listen to your anger. And I always, I'm committed to understanding the other. If somebody has a different belief or a different opinion than mine, I will not rigidly believe that I am right I always entertain the idea that maybe I'm wrong or that you know reality is subjective and we each have a a valid perspective but yeah I've been called I've been called radical probably you know because I did a master's in in peace studies and we actually we talked about this in, in our class once where you know peace activists are radical in a sense because they're pushing for this idea of of peace and a better future and that's kind of but so be it it's just a word whatever (laughs) call it what you want (laughs) okay so what would your definition be of this or how would you call yourself then myself so i first and foremost i am human (laughs) Uh, i i really never thought to label it it's just kind of my nature my my way of being it's it's tied into all of my work and all of the fun the extracurriculars that i do I guess people would call me an activist, although I don't necessarily see myself that way. I see the word activist as kind of like, you know, oppositional, like you're fighting something, Mm. but I don't see it as a fight. I see it just as 
I like personally with my work I just try to facilitate communication and understanding and you know I'm a work in progress as well so I don't know what mm -hmm. my end career will be or what I'll be doing um, necessarily in the future but I know that it will involve people and communicating and creating more understanding empathy yeah and you studied psychology and also part of it was solving conflicts and creating clear communication so when someone gets into a conflict how would you resolve that and what would be the steps to go further to a more, more peaceful conversation that is a very very good question so yeah i studied psychology in my undergrad and i also did a minor in political science and you know the funny thing is they don't teach you this we should be taught how to deal with conflict in schools for example because you're just not mm -hmm. taught these things and so so huh, I was reading a an internet an internet meme yesterday and it, it said something like 80% of conflicts are caused because somebody hasn't eaten yet. <laughs> that really makes me laugh because it's true. <laughs> yeah, I get hangry. I don't know about you. <laughs> but to resolve conflict, when we are in a conflict with someone, something to keep in mind. This is something borrowed from psychology that you can apply to your life. The person is always trying to make you feel how they feel. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's like, for example, I'll, I'll bring it down to a smaller example. If a mother is dealing with a screaming toddler, that screaming toddler is trying to make the mother feel exactly how it feels. So if you are right. the mother and you are feeling frustrated and angry at this child, that child is feeling frustrated and angry. It's the same with adults. If somebody is throwing insults at you and they're trying to make you feel like crap, they also mm -hmm. feel like crap. They do. So you can defuse it by reacting with kindness. And this is the hardest thing to practice because when your ego is, is triggered and when you are targeted, it just becomes super, super complicated. But another thing to consider when we have conflicts is that conflicts can occur when we have a conflict of interest. So mm -hmm. you want something, this other person wants another thing. How do you, how do you find a middle ground? And that's, that's when it gets tricky. And in these types of scenarios, we have to consider the fact that there are third options. And you can get really creative with trying to come up with ways where both parties can get what they want. Uh, for example, so the founder of Peace and Conflict Studies, Johan Galtung, he was a conflict mediator. So this is you know, a part of his work. He mediated conflicts internationally. And there was a conflict between two South American countries over this plot of land. I believe it was Peru and Nicaragua, maybe. Peru for sure. I'm not sure what the other country was, honestly. Well. <laughs> but there was a conflict. They had fought wars over this piece of land, that, like for years, like three wars. And there was just no way that they were going to come to an agreement with this. And then Galtung, as a mediator, he speaks to both sides. And they come to a very, very creative agreement that worked and that ended all the wars. And do you know what this was? They basically made this plot of land a common zone between both countries. So it belonged to both of them. And they made it a national park. And they invested in it and they made it beautiful. And it generated income, money, for, for both countries. And everybody was happy. And there you go. So there really are ways that both sides can win. And then you have your Israel and Palestine conflicts and your, you know, Armenia <laughs> and Azerbaijan conflicts that are a bit more difficult to deal with. Yeah. But, you know, it's a work in progress. We still have a lot, long way to go. And another thing is also if the other person doesn't want peace, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't really do much there. If somebody is committed mm. to, to keeping the conflict alive. So how to let go of that? How, how can we let go? That's, you know, that's, that's one issue that the world faces that we don't quite have answers towards yet. But I believe that if we have to remember that we're all human and that we all belong to one another, sometimes we forget this. And uh, you have to want peace to, to create it. And we need to prioritize peace. We need to prioritize it. And we need to be, yeah, we need to be willing to see ourselves as bad because oftentimes, you know, we hurt people. And this occurs at the, the national level of countries and at the individual level. It does. And as, we, as you also mentioned in the beginning and also now, we are all responsible for our own feelings. If we feel something, we try to make the other person feel the same way. So how can we 
get get rid of it within ourselves so we don't, we don't even start making the other person feel bad how what, how does that work that's the, yeah so the first thing would be do not push that negative emotion away for example if you are prone to you know getting triggered with anger and reacting angrily at at your mother or your boyfriend or whoever it is like you're just kind of a rage monster <laughs> don't push your anger away okay you don't have to express it but sit with it just listen to what it's trying to tell you because emotions are kind of like like little little alert signals they're they're making you aware of a boundary that you have or something that's not being expressed and the interesting thing with anger for example is that it's a cover emotion it's like ice on the sheet of a lake behind anger there's always something else it's it's usually helplessness so you have to deal with that underlying emotion so look deeper into it don't run away from it don't make it bad or wrong but also don't hurt people because you know it's only going to make things worse you're not going to get your thought across and you're not going to create resolve in that in that relationship mm. so really sit with yourself get on that meditation meditate do your breathing techniques <laughs> reflect write uh, journaling is excellent it's like therapy but personal therapy for yourself like if you're angry another practice that i recommend to people is to take a piece of paper and a pen and just go crazy write everything that's making you angry it diffuses the emotion and then and then you gain awareness also as to why you're feeling the way you're feeling. Mm. So yeah, in a nutshell, don't demonize your emotions, sit with them, listen to what they're telling you and also try to have compassion and empathy for the person in front of you. Mm. And when we have done that, when we have become aware of why we feel the same way, why it triggered us because I think it's kind of a trigger that makes you feel like okay, I snap now. So when we are aware of that, do we let others know? So do we let that person who triggered us know? Or do we just kind of let it go? I I would say communicate it. Absolutely. This stuff strengthens relationships when we can be vulnerable enough to say, you know, I was really hurt by by that. I felt this way and I I made it mean this. I made it mean that I was this way. People their their guards will melt melt away. And that's how you deepen connection by being vulnerable mm. to others. But then don't you think like when you express that, like, yeah, that made me feel this way, then it kind of create like it's of course vulnerability, but in a way your head created an extra version of what they have meant and they didn't mean that way. So like, it kind of hurts them to to do it, even though they didn't mean it that way. So you know, you get you get what I mean. Yeah. I mean, if you were in a conflict with the person and they just thought you hated them or that you were lashing out at them for no reason, it's it's probably better to be vulnerable and really express the genuine emotion there than than to make mm. than to allow them to make it mean something else entirely in their own heads. So always be honest. Uh, yeah, and also conflict in life is inevitable. It's a part of life. But the way that we deal with it and the way that we manage it is everything. You can either manage it in a way where you I grow and that. learn, or you can leave it to, to to take its own course and you know go wild and blow up to unbelievable proportions, like like war. Mm. Yeah. And I really love the expression. I actually wrote it down immediately when you said, "We are victims of victims." Could you elaborate on that? What you mean by that, and how you think of that? Like I was saying before, hurt people hurt people. Happy people don't don't go around causing others pain. At least not intentionally. But a lot of the times we go through these traumas in our lives, and they cause us to act in certain ways. Maybe sometimes in hurtful ways. And by understanding that the person that is hurting you is also hurt you create compassion and with that compassion you you can no longer blame them but a lot of the times when we are hurt it's an ego thing as well so you, we make it mean something like we're not good enough this person doesn't love me you know i'm flawed i'm not enough i think that's actually at the root of it it's like we make it mean that we are not enough yeah. Or that we are bad and we are, you know, bad or evil or unacceptable mm. in some way. And that damages our ego, which is fine. Again, we're humans. We have egos. Like, we have arms and noses and eyes. 
but by understanding that it's not necessarily about you it's that person that they're in they're not in peace internally they're not in alignment and that's why they go around hurting people then you are able to remove yourself from that and you you can live your own life and if that person is super toxic and they don't want to get better or they keep hurting you then sometimes the best thing would be to keep some distance just to protect yourself because you can't force people into awareness but yeah just understand that it's not about you and that would at least make you feel better and that's that's why it's so important to be creating that peace within at the individual level because when you do that you will no longer hurt people you will no longer hurt people because doing so will also hurt you and you don't want that that goes against your ego's nature so i think that's what we should be selfish with in today's day and age be selfish with with radiating love and with you know developing yourself to the point where you no, no longer hurt others because there's no need for it you understand your own mind and you understand what is causing you to do these things you look those shadows in their yeah. face and you you know they disappear in daylight and then and then you you radiate peace you no longer cause harm you know this this goes for everybody for both sides of every conflict it's beautiful it's beautifully put and i love how you expressed it what was a story that you learned the most from so throughout your work or throughout your studies you mentioned this guy uh johan but i was like probably there were so many others that you could learn from so what was a study that was like yes this is something that i want to implement in my life or in my practices or how i look at the world a study or a story I can give you a little cute interesting story actually. This story is I think I first heard it when I was 17 and it just it's so simple and cute. let me just tell you it. So it's the story of the elephant and the steak. Maybe you've heard it before. But basically yes. basically so how they train baby elephants is they tie them to a stake in the ground so they don't run away. And these baby elephants they try to break free but they can't because they're so small and weak and they can't break the chain that's binding them to the ground. But then the elephants they grow and they become enormous to the point where they could easily, you know, move a little bit and the, the mm -hmm. chain would shatter. But they don't. They do not because because they stop trying. You know, what holds them there trapped is this limiting belief that they have in their minds. They still think they're that baby elephant who is too weak to move the, the chain, but they're not anymore. And, and th the good news is that these limiting beliefs that we have, they can be changed. We can choose different beliefs. We can choose beliefs that are conducive to peace and, and that, that empower us. So we're not doomed. There's no, there's no death sentence with, with these types of things, no matter what you've been through. No matter what conflicts exist in your life, no matter how much pain is that, no matter how much you hate yourself, if you hate yourself, we all, we've all been there. I've been there. There, you can always change it. Like there's always, there's always a way out of it. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. All the time we can do that anytime, but we first need to realize and get aware, like what is that limiting belief? And sometimes you just need to seek help or I get to someone who helps us push through it because that is the hardest one to now I know it what do I do with it so what was your limiting belief and how did you break through it so okay so growing up I wasn't the most confident person I've had some experiences with bullying and just different things that really like erased my confidence as an individual like five years ago if you told me that I would be talking on a podcast I would have been like yeah right no not me <laughs> But then when I started to get into the self-awareness stuff and I started doing the work, the inner work and transforming all of those shadows and really looking at my pain and, and learning the lessons, I was able to move forward from that. You know, a lot of the times we keep ourselves tied to that stake in the ground. We, we, we become attached to, to our pain because it's all that we know and we, we, <sighs> it's so embedded into our identities at some as sometimes you know sometimes it's like okay if I don't have this pain or this issue or who am I right you even have this with collectives on this on the larger scale it's so interesting to see how entire cultures can be attached to certain painful experiences you know that keep them alive even because it's so ingrained in the identity but at a certain point you oh, yeah, yes. yeah 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 
and this causes so many issues. So in the same way that an individual should look into their history and their inner pain and, and traumas and resolve them to create inner peace, you know, we can also be doing this at the international level with different countries and their histories. For example, with this history book that I'm writing, you have to look at the problem. You have to understand what led it to become, to manifest in order to create that resolve. So yeah, yeah, in a way, it's like the, the psychology work that you do at the individual level. This is what I'm doing with Lebanon. It's like, look into your history. This trauma caused this, and this is why you're so messed up. Yeah. Well, we can change it. <laughs> doing psychology on a political and country scale. That's my passion. Yeah, I love just bringing those two together. <laughs> It does sound super exciting and a different way of looking at history and different way of looking at our countries. Thank you for making all the work and putting in all this effort and talking to all these people for us so we can, we can be aware of it. So we are leading up to our final questions, which the first one is, what is your definition of success? My definition of success I see success as something subjective. It means something different to each person. But I would say success, success is our ability to, to fully actualize our personal potentials. So reaching your highest state of being, you know, as Aniko or as Amanda. The highest version of Amanda is going to be different than the highest version of Aniko or, or from anybody else. But really being able to focus on your inner journey and to be true to yourself, that's success. Because a lot of the times in our societies, we are told that, you know, this is success, being a doctor or an engineer. If you're not a doctor or an engineer, you're a failure. That's how it is in my culture, guys. That's how it was. Mm. But then to have the courage to deviate from that and to go after what comes naturally to what you're drawn towards, what brings you joy, that is success. Yeah, <laughs> that's my idea of success. Yes, definitely. Finding our own inner journey and just going through with it doesn't matter who does what. This is my journey, that is your journey, and we are the same, we are equal. Yeah. No matter where, where the journey We complement one another. If each person would follow their joy, the world would be a much, much better place. <laughs> it, it would be mm -hmm. more efficient, too. You wouldn't have people in jobs that they hate. Although that is a bit lofty and idealistic, but that's, you know, a lot of a lot of the, that's a lot of how it is my second question to you is we have been talking about peace and you were so passionate and i love your passion and dedication towards this this topic but if you would have one minute to share your message with the whole world like your most important message and the whole world would be listening right now what would that message be in that one minute in one minute, my message to the world would be, I like this, it's like a soapbox moment. Okay, my message to the world would be <laughs> that empathy is so important. I know we, we all intuitively understand this, but it's one thing to say it and another to practice it. This is, this is in essence what every religion has preached throughout time, what every you know, wise man and guru, it's, it's about taking the other as a part of yourself. I think that's the panacea to all of the world's problems. Okay, not all of the world's problems. But besides <laughs> that, it's, it's okay, the reason for this is because if you think about it, effective communication is the backbone of peace. You know, to have something like sustainable development, you need peace first. You can't have mm -hmm. sustainable development in a war-torn country where everything just keep, keeps you know, getting destroyed. But we need effective communication to have peace in the first place, both at the personal, interpersonal level and at the large-scale level. So that's, that's my two cents, you know, just communicate with yourself, mm -hmm. with others. Yeah, in a peaceful way, without the conflicts, being aware, just reflecting back everything that we have been talking about in the past one hour. Yeah. Yeah. Effective communication and true communication. Yeah, that's that's the base of everything. As you said, the backbone of the fish. Yeah. <laughs> the third question is that um, you are asking questions from people yeah. on your podcast on different ways and... I think you are doing amazing living it. 
What is a question that you like asking people? What is a question that you think everybody should be asked? And what would be your answer to that? Oh, okay. So, so there are two questions that I ask everyone that comes on the, the Let's Talk Peace podcast. And those questions are, one, what does the world you want to live in look like? I like to ask this question because it makes one, you know, envision what they want to create, which is super important because you have to start thinking about something before it becomes reality. And the second question mm-hmm. I ask everyone is, what is peace according to you? And I ask this question because I want people to, to get thinking about peace, you know, because you need to start thinking about it mm-hmm. again before you can actually take action within the world and within your own life. So what does the world I want to live in look like? I want to live in a world where radical empathy is the norm, where we are committed to understanding one another. Because again, effective communication, that's, that's where it all starts. I want to live in a world where people can pursue what they are naturally inclined towards and there's, there's no pressure to, to be something that you are not because that way you will never be happy. You know, the purpose of life is not to arrive to death having lived according to someone someone else's idea of success or somebody else's standards for for you life is to be enjoyed and the other thing that i would want in my ideal world is to have a world with with positive peace so galtung's vision of a perfect peace where structural violence is is not a thing where there is nothing that obstructs human development be that the promotion of, of foods that actually kill you or of government systems that, that prevent justice and where our cultures can live in harmony as well because a lot of these issues that exist within different civilizations, if you will, they, they can easily be solved if we were just committed to communication. And the second question that I ask people, what is peace according to you? And my definition of peace, I can say it in one word, it's love. To take the other as a part of yourself. That's that's what peace is. Loving yourself, loving others. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amanda. It was an incredible chat. And I'm so happy that you shared all this knowledge, all this passion with us. It was like, from the beginning, I was like, oh, okay, let, let's hear more. She's so <laughs> passionate that she's so happy to share it with us. And so many insightful things that you, you have um, in your daily life that you practice. So I just truly look up to you and I wish you the very best luck with your work. I think you are doing something incredible for our world. And don't stop with Lebanon. I think that's a good start, but then look into some other cultures because we all need to learn from our histories. We all need to learn from our past, but we just, some reason we don't do it. Either on a personal scale or on a country scale. So continue and grow, please do. Thank you so much. I had so much fun. Thanks for having me. Let's talk peace. This is my challenge for you for the next couple of weeks to try to be aware of your feelings and feel empathy towards the people we interact with on a daily basis. I love the passion that Amanda expressed her thoughts with and how she said that we are victims of victims. We need to start to understand the bigger picture that is not necessarily us and we shall just accept each other as the way we are. I would love to hear what was your take on the episode. Share it on the comments or on social media. You can find me both on Instagram and on Facebook. And if you have any suggestions on a guest or if you would like to hear about a specific topic, let me know on on the ball with Aniku at gmail.com. Also, if you have any questions to Amanda or to me, feel free to reach out. I would love to hear from you. If you found this episode motivating, make sure that you share it with others and text this to your friend right now who you think would be inspired by this story. The best way to live a happy and fulfilled life is to serve others. So share this episode with people you care about. It has no cost, but will elevate them and make their lives even better. If this is your first time here, click that love and subscribe buttons and make sure that you leave a rating and review. I would love to hear your thoughts and feedback on how this message lifted you up, brought you a change into your life. I would also love to hear your own definition of success. I'm so grateful for your support, sending love and great health to you all. And now it is time for you to be on the ball.